He recently launched GeoLab, which is an innovation collaborative based in LA that designs innovation projects for global organizations. Um, and one of the things that I found so interesting, he says that he lives, eats, breathes, and laughs innovation. I love that line of laughing innovation, so we may have to get you to tell us what you mean by that. He says that he speaks five languages, but um, I already know that he actually is developing fluency in a sixth language around distributed trust and blockchain, which is a language that we are all going to have to learn. So, um, Kian, you're going to have to teach us a little bit how to speak this new world. So please join us. Thank you. Good morning, IPP. I know you guys all had a very late night drinking and writing poems. Who writes poetry at business conferences? So I thought I'd just dive right into it and give you guys a pop quiz. Ready for this? All right. Who can tell me what film this scene is from? Star Wars, what planet is it? Tatooine, very good. Who can tell me what scene this film is from? Mad Max, yes, and this is the war rig that Charlize Theron drives in Mad Max Fury Road. And who can tell me what film this scene is from? Alice in Wonderland, a fantasy world. All right, who can tell me what scene this film is from? Burning Man. Who's been to Burning Man? Raise your hand. No, okay, not people in, up from staff, attendees, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess this is going to be a new experience. We're over there. Sir, you've been to Burning Man. Tell me about Burning Man. What's it like? Uh, instant community out in the middle of nowhere. Instant community out in the middle of nowhere. Perfect. Thank you very much. This is Black Rock City. This is a 70,000 person pop-up city that convenes autonomously in the middle of the desert, two hours north of Reno, in the middle of the desert. In the end of August, it's extremely, extremely hot. This is a place where burners, or what Burning Man attendees call themselves, pursue these artistic projects in individual collaboration to create these communities which are so radically different than what we see in our present world. And at the end of it, they break down all the tents, all the RVs, and go back, and they don't leave a single trace until the following year, they reconvene again. Now, Burning Man happens at the end of August every year, and I've hosted this conference for six years in the middle of September. There's no Wi-Fi in Burning Man, and my team basically said, you could never go to Burning Man. <laughs> and so when I got the chance this year to go, I jumped at it, because I've been dying to go for so many years. So, in my very first day at Burning Man, my very first hour, I find myself deep in the playa, this, this alkaline desert, in the middle of this dust storm. I can't see anything. I'm completely, completely lost, and I'm starving. Starving because I haven't eaten in maybe like 28 hours, and that's because I've been stuck in traffic <laughs> for like 20 of those hours, with 70,000 people going down the single lane road in the middle of the desert. Now, you have to understand, one of the main principles of Burning Man is radical self-reliance. And I totally failed in the first hour. <laughs> I was starving, I was thirsty, I was lost, I had no idea what to do. So I fumbled my way around and I made my way to the man. Now. If you don't know much about Burning Man, there's this big man, it's like about 70 foot high, it's lit up at night, it's in the middle of the geographic center of Black Rock City. And um, I, I decided to go there because I said, at least I'll find my bearings. I walk into the man and sit down, and all of a sudden, I see a friend who I haven't seen in years come up to me and help me out. And eventually the dust storm lifts, and we go outside. And who do I find? But I find this woman, dressed like a ape with a shopping cart full of bananas. Now, one of the other radical principles of Burning Man is that there is no uh, buying of things. It's decommodified. The only thing you can buy is ice and coffee, neither of which helped me because I was, again, starving <laughs> after 28 hours. And so I was really happy to see this monkey woman. 
It was a blessing, fresh air. I was so happy. I ate, and then she took me to this place called the Hug Deli. Now, the Hug Deli is a place where you convene, and you can get hugs. And the whole idea is to give. Now, Burning Man has this uh, economy where you can't buy anything. The economy is based on gifting and on giving, and the whole idea is so that everybody can live in a world of abundance. So at the Hug Deli, you meet people, they give you hugs, and you essentially are able to find people who you can have amazing conversations with and connect, just over a very brief human hug. Now, Burning Man is by far the most creatively magical place I've ever been. And I've seen lots of really cool innovation. And you see things there that are these uh, amazing experiences of um, self-expression and performance art that you don't see anywhere else in the world. For example, you might see a polar bear <laughs> roaming around the desert. And in fact, this polar bear right now is right in front of the ferry building uh, because of the climate change conference across the street. Or you might find a sailboat cruising across the desert, or maybe even a dragon breathing fire underneath a rainbow. Now, Burning Man is a place where some people go to get lost and to find themselves. Let me tell you about one of the other principles of Burning Man. It is about radical inclusion. Anybody can participate. And there are no velvet ropes to any of the events. Everybody is invited, as long as there's space capacity. There are no gatekeepers of any kind. Now, what this means is that you end up having uh, all kinds of subcultures imaginable, whether they are techies or hippies or artists or uh, deadheads, even classical musicians and uh, spiritual wanderers are a uh, burning man. Of course, you have people who um, are dancers and they're raving all night long to sunrise to electronic dance music. Uh, at the same time, you have even anarchists who are fighting to the death under these thunderdomes like Mad Max, trying to take over the world. This is real. Um, and you even have uh, hippies who want to change the world through radical self-transformation and yoga. But that's not all. You even have gurus who run workshops after workshops after workshops. This is a camp called Decentral. This is one of many camps at Burning Man devoted to blockchain technology and how it can serve us for good. Now you can see, uh, it's packed, right? <laughs> It's full of millennials, young people who are really interested in this idea of how can we better the economic system using this new technology. Now, what I loved at Burning Man was that I met these philanthropists, I met these entrepreneurs, I met these artists and these change makers whose motto was, how can we bend reality to our will? And how can we self-create? So Burning Man is not a political place. Uh, this is my second favorite art installation because it says all art is political except yours. Yours just sucks. Uh, you have people from the left. You have people from the right. You have hippies. You have venture capitalists. You have uh, conservatives. You have libertarians. And they're all here to create a quasi-egalitarian community that is at the intersection of individual contribution and communic civic responsibility. And that is beautiful. Burning Man is possibly one of the most spiritual places I've ever been and extremely transformative. It's completely anti-consumerist um, and it really requires radical participation. You can't just be passive. You can't just um, hang out. You're, you're expected to contribute. And it's, it's not for everybody right away. Now, at the second to last day, what do we do but burn down the man? And it's kind of crazy. We build this tall man and then we gather all around it, 70,000 people, and we burn it down. Why do we do that? Well, it's an experiment, of course, in radical presence and immediacy, and to help us really think about expression and free thought. But it made me think. What if this is all real? Yes, Burning Man is a temporary autonomous zone that lives totally orthogonally to the structures of centralized society. It's a society that has weird currency, like bananas and hugs <laughs> and giving away gifts. There's very few rules, but at the same time, it's expected to collaborate and create something together. And burners keep coming back year after year after year. 
And when you come back on the first day, what do they say? Welcome home. This is home. So it made me wonder, why does this community thrive? Maybe it thrives because it taps into our deep human desire for complete self-expression without uh, fear of reprisal, ownership, or censorship. And maybe, just maybe, it taps into our deep primal desire for freedom from linear thinking. Now, you've heard a lot about linear thinking from Peter yesterday. Burning Man has grown exponentially over the last decade or two. And actually, since 2008, it's doubled. Now, 2008 is an important year. Let me tell you why. It's important because I believe this is the year that the future was born. This is the year where we converged three events that have radically created this opportunity for a decentralized society. I'm gonna explain them to you one by one. Remember, three. All right, so we know what happened in 2008. The most obvious one is the financial crisis, right? What happened exactly this week 10 years ago? Lehman Brothers went bankrupt exactly this week 10 years ago. And it broke a social contract between the public the elites and those who are being governed. And their trust in financial institutions has completely plummeted over the last 10 years and also by those regulators. Raise your hand if you know someone who lost their job during the financial crisis. Raise your hand if you know someone who lost their house because of the financial crisis. Look around. This 10 years has been an open rebellion against the elites and the experts who led us here. And we've seen this rise of new political movements on the left, like Occupy Wall Street, and on the right, like the Tea Party, and all across the world in reaction to what happened over the last 10 years. But some people had a pretty good run over the last 10 years. You had the 1%, which over the last 10 years, the after-tax income of the 1% of Americans in the red line has grown exponentially compared to everybody else in the socioeconomic classes. And at the same time, we're seeing income inequality increase dramatically. This is a chart of the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is a proxy for inequality. The closer you are to zero, the more equal society, the higher you are to one, the more unequal society. You can see all the trends are generally going up, except for France. I don't know what's going on with France. Maybe it's a 35-hour work week. Now, what's interesting is that at the same time, we've had corporate profits increase dramatically to record highs. But companies are having a very hard time finding employees because unemployment is really, really low. So what's happened is that we're essentially living in a new monopolistic age. And when monopolies exist and profitability is really high, it's natural in economics when companies come into an industry, they compete, and then eventually profits go down, it gets to an equilibrium, and you go forward. But this isn't happening over the last 10 years because of a lot of industrial consolidation. Over the last 20 years, we've seen the number of firms listed on public stock exchanges halve to the point that right now there's fewer companies on US public stock exchanges than there was in the 1970s when our GDP was one third the size of it is right now. Now my friend, uh, Jonathan Tepper, just published this amazing book called The Myth of Capitalism, coming out next month, where he looked at industry after industry after industry, and he realized that Americans really have this false illusion of choice. That even though we think we have choice, the reality is that in almost every industry, there's probably two or three players that dominate. So for example, in the beer industry, there's two companies that have a 90% share of the beer industry. In health insurance, in most states, um, there's two companies who provide health insurance, or maybe just one, and now there's policy reasons for that. And even like in the beef market, there's four companies that dominate 90 plus percent of the beef market. So you might think this is good. Well, in the 20th century, this was probably good. Because in the 20th century, business was rewarded by being more efficient. And the bigger you were, the more likely it was that you were efficient. Now, as you hear tomorrow from John Hagel, the future isn't about scalable efficiency and being bigger. It's really about scalable learning and being nimble. And I think in the 21st century, being bigger and centralized isn't necessarily better. So just think about that.
All right, that's the first thing that happened in 2008. Second thing that happened in 2008, what was the technology innovation that radically changed how we interact with each other in 2008? Smartphone, what about the smartphone? Go on, connectivity, something was released. Apple opened the App Store. And that was the very beginning in 2008 that we now see Apple as a trillion dollar economy and even Amazon. This is an acronym that many, uh, many in uh, the uh, investment community refer to Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google as the FANG stocks. Now, as we've seen this increased cons consolidation in the business world, we're seeing it in the tech world as well. And this is a problem. It's becoming a lot more expensive for startups to compete against these large companies. So for example, oftentimes entrepreneurs have to build on top of these systems, but the rules can be changed at any time. And so why would you build on top of these systems? But you may not have much of a choice. Even established tech companies, for example, Snapchat. Who uses Snapchat? Raise your hand. All right, a couple of people. This is the silent generation here. <laughs> um, Snapchat, it took seven years to get to 150 million users. And uh, Facebook was able to do that in one year by copying its business model, putting it on Instagram. So even a public company like Snapchat is having a hard time competing against these tech giants. Now, let me explain why this is. Um, this is an amazing chart by Chris Dixon, who is a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, the VC firm, explaining uh, the life cycle of technology platforms. Basically, very early on, on the left side, as technology platforms build up, they do everything they can to attract uh, third parties, whether it's developers or businesses or new media, Basically, they're trying to create this vaunted like, network effect. But as you move up the S-curve, um, you start realizing that they're moving away from, oops, they're moving away from competition, I'm sorry, cooperation over to competition. I think my slides are moving, if you guys don't mind fixing them. Thank you so much. Um, examples of this include Google and Yelp. So Google and Yelp were very collaborative early on, but then we saw that essentially Yelp was pushed out. Or Facebook and Zynga. Zynga built this gaming engine on top of Facebook until Facebook changed the rules. So um, it almost feels like a bait and switch tactic. So what do we do about this? Um, I think there's really two mainstream arguments that we should do about these technology monopolies. One is to regulate them, uh, and the other is to get consumers to change their behavior. Both of those are really hard to do. Um, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you guys think these five tech companies have a predominance of power in the economy today. Raise your hand. Wow, great. Well, you're not alone. I think we are seeing a dramatic decrease in trust in society for social media companies and, social and, and search engines and technology firms. We're blaming the internet for all of our social ills, whether it's Russian hacking or hate speech or hacked emails and all that kind of stuff. And we're starting to believe right now that maybe these centralized technology platforms and their business models aren't in the long-term interests of our citizens in a democracy. So just think about that. But here's the thing I want to point out. It didn't have to end up this way. The internet is the way it is because early on, in the early web, we made decisions to essentially pursue particular incentives. For example, create an advertising-based economy which now has essentially created a place where only the loudest, more obnoxious things get attention in social media. If you go back to the early days of the web, you guys remember this page? <laughs> yeah, 1994, Yahoo, I, I was in college, it was great. Um, the web was designed as an open system where anybody could access these protocols, these softwares like email, GPS, HTTP, FTP, uh, and nobody owned these protocols, they were shared comments. And it was designed to be a place where people can have decentralized communications with each other. In, we, in Web 1.0, which is essentially the time before the dot-com bust uh, around 2000, it was a great place to go online and get any information you wanted. Uh, th the Web was static. It didn't allow for any kind of interactivity. And we basically trusted everything we read online to be true. At least, I did. Um, and then we fast-forwarded to the mid-2000s, and things started changing. We realized we couldn't trust everything we read online, and we couldn't trust every Nigerian prince who emailed us asking for money. 
So we started moving towards these centralized platforms, and we joined these platforms that facilitated trust, that streamlined interaction and encouraged connectivity. And this was Web 2.0. We started trusting people that we had never trusted before. For example, getting into a random stranger's car in an Uber instead of a taxi, or staying at a random stranger's house on Airbnb instead of going to a hotel. Now, Airbnb, what year was it founded? 2008. It's a big year. The structure of the internet started changing, and these Web 2.0 companies started creating these um, closed architectures and proprietary databases, which made sense at the time. And now let's be honest, they're, they're businesses like any other business. Um, they're, they're not providing just social goodwill for us. They're trying to make money. But they're making money off of us. We are the product <laughs> that they are selling. Think about that. So now I think we're on the verge of a new era of the internet, which uh, people have called Web 3.0. I think in this era, we're going to transact directly, peer-to-peer -peer with each other, and without the need for centralized platforms and technologies and gatekeepers who have essentially told us who we should trust for the last 15 years. But guess what? Nobody trusts these centralized platforms anymore. So if you remember, I said that we started having financial crises and disgruntled populations. We've had those in the past, but what's different is that only now, in 2008, did we start developing technology that allows us to reorient the economics of society without a revolution and without radical economic redistribution. And this takes me to the third thing that happened in 2008. A genius arrives. Somebody by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto we don't know who this person is. It could be a man, it could be a woman, it could be a group of uh, individuals came together. Um, it could be Japanese, it could be Portuguese, doesn't really matter. Um, but Satoshi published an experimental white paper which outlined essentially the foundations of what we now call crypto economics and the Bitcoin protocol which was launched very soon afterwards. Now, distributed ledger technologies like blockchain aren't new. They've been around for a couple of decades. But Satoshi did two things that made this very unique. He added two new elements on top of the distributed technology, which allowed us to solve an inf information security problem. And the first one was applying cryptography to be able to understand consensus. So in a system where there's no central environment, you have to figure out how all the computers agree on what is consensus. And he used cryptography for that. And the second thing is applying incentive economics like virtual currencies and Bitcoin to encourage people to maintain this headless central, uh, decentralized system. So I know you've heard about the blockchain. Uh, let me just kind of explain it as simply as I can. And I'm not going to go into uh, technical detail because it's going to get technically ugly <laughs> really quickly and boring. Um, the blockchain is essentially a distributed database of information that's stored in duplicate on hundreds of thousands of computers all across the world. Every time we add new information, what we call a block, to this database, computers around the world are incentivized to encrypt this data and add it privately to all the other pieces of information that came before it, hence the term block chain, because it's a chain of blocks. And once this information is added, it becomes immutable and unchangeable because all of this blockchain includes all of the information of all the information that came behind it, kind of like this massive nesting doll <laughs> that is being built up over time, right? So this blockchain is a permanent database and it can store all kinds of information, whether it's uh, data or digital value. So um, because the blockchain is decentralized, there's no central authority that manages it. So it's really critical to develop the right incentives to make sure this macroeconomic model works. So think about this kind of like the monetary policy for a cryptocurrency. I'm not going to go into all the details, but these are, this is essentially the layers of the blockchain. Um, and you need to know about it. The very bottom one is the internet, TCP IP, which has been around for 50 plus years. Uh, you have P2P networks, which are the hardware of computers all around the world that are connected to each other. You then have consensus rules. And consensus rules are essentially like uh, this governance for how these computers will agree that something is valid and something is true. 
There are different kinds of consensus mechanisms and algorithms, and you'll hear about some of that later today in the next session. Um, and then we have the transaction database, which holds all the data, tokens, which I'll talk about in a second, which incentivizes people to actually maintain the database. And then these things called smart contracts, which are essentially these hard-coded rules for how trustless relationships could interact with each other. Everything from smart contracts and down, you won't see in the world. What you'll see is probably the top layer, these decentralized applications, which is sort of like uh, the touchy-feely UX side of the blockchain. Let me say a few words about uh, incentives and tokens. Tokens and coins are the fuel in a cryptocurrency e uh, economy. Tokens don't replace real money like dollars or yen or euros, all that kind of stuff. They're kind of like tokens at an arcade. You need them to play the game. And you need them to be able to derive value from this particular crypto economic model or whatever service is being offered. Um, the economics of tokens are such that you earn more by creating more in the system, by advancing the network. So instead of actually owning the equity, you're perhaps adding value by adding to the, the distributed ledger, building an application on it, or even using the system even more. And that's how you earn more of these tokens, depending on the crypto economic model. And uh, it incentivizes participation, just like Burning Man does. Everybody has to participate in order for the value to increase. What kind of tokens are there? Um, well, tokens are essentially a, a, a digital asset that can represent all kinds of things, whether they're IOUs or whether it's value or whether it's uh, particular assets. You're probably most familiar with the top layer, uh, cryptocurrency uh, token of Bitcoin and Ether, which are essentially stores of value. But we also have utility tokens, which are tokens that, are, again, are used to put gas into the system to get something out of that particular uh, blockchain environment. You have asset tokens, which represent fractional ownership of particular assets like diamonds or gold. You have equity tokens, which are more like traditional financial instruments of equity. And you even have uh, reward tokens that encourage good behavior and reputation. So after having said all this, what are these crypto entrepreneurs building? Now remember what I said earlier, I don't know many web entrepreneurs building new technology on existing legacy infrastructure that is dominated by big tech. It's stupid to do that because they can change the rules at any time. Most people I know are building on crypto economic models. Now they're doing one of either two things. They're either building at the infrastructure protocol level, which is sort of like the B2B level of, uh, of blockchain. Um, it's all basically around computation, the storage, and all that kind of stuff. Or they're building more cooler stuff, um, decentralized applications, which are more around like the vertical use cases for consumers in a particular model. Now, we call these dApps. Instead of apps, we call them dApps. And the use of these dApps is all around particular tokens and being able to derive value from them. So for example, uh, there's a social network called Steemit, which is similar to Reddit. And every time you add comments to Steemit, you earn a particular token and, token. and you can use that token to cash it in for a particular reward. What kind of apps, dApps are there? On the left-hand side, you see the existing Web 2.0 economy. Uh, you have browsers, uh, storage systems, social networks, all this kind of stuff. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the Web 3.0 versions. So entrepreneurs all around you are building these dApps. Now, there's over 2,000 of them right now live on dApp stores, <laughs> decentralized dApp stores, centralized decentralized dApp stores. Um, but let me say this, we're very much at the infancy of this economy. And there's gonna be some that will fail. And the ones that'll succeed are the ones that are gonna create value in a way that provides more privacy, provides more utility, and provides some things in a faster way. And this is sort of like what led to this exponential uh, explosion of crowdfunding over the last couple of years using initial coin offerings. Has anybody participated in an ICO? One person. Does anybody own cryptocurrency? Not anymore, okay. All right. <laughs> Maybe you want to hold, hold that for a little bit longer. Um, so this is creating a very new business models. Um, traditional business models, you guys are very familiar with this. You have a few decision makers at the top. Uh, it takes a lot of organizational oversight. And the revenues are kind of based on the things that you might be familiar with. The attention economy, advertising, transaction fees. This is run on a little bit. I'll just read it out to you. Uh, commission, subscription dues, all that kind of stuff. 
Now, the decentralized economy uh, looks different. Uh, decision making is democratized by the owners, the majority owners of tokens in an economic system. And the incentives are very different. And the kind of way you make money in this system is not based on using other people's data, it's based on creating utility and using it and creating value for users. So the dilemma to think about is how can you create a business model with having, without having access to uh, data and targeted ads, but actually are providing a service to uh, consumers. So I'm just wrapping up here. Um, there, will be, there will be people who say this is fraudulent and this is silly and there are bubbles. And yes, all of that is true and there are failures. And we've had poor protocol designs that have led to uh, hacks and lost tokens and fraud. But uh, look at this chart. This is sort of like where the internet evolved, the web 2.0 internet, and how uh, essentially we got to a point where um, we got to the dot-com bubble and then eventually passed it and we created these widespread applications. And the same thing is happening in this blockchain economy, in this decentralized economy. We've had the bubble burst earlier this year. We're in deep winter, and that's probably a good thing because it's going to actually ferret out a lot of these bad projects and allow entrepreneurs to build a real value. So let me leave you with three takeaways. If you think technology isn't working the way it should for society, you can't tweak it at the margins and you can't regulate it. You have to create a radically new disruptive code. It's kind of like running your businesses. You have these legacy systems that take a long time to turn the ship around. So instead of doing that, maybe you go build outside the legacy system something that's radically new. The second takeaway is that open protocols always win over closed protocols. So make sure you create open protocols. I don't know if Peter mentioned this yesterday. There's a guy uh, named Bill Joy, who was the co-founder of Sun Microsystems. He said that the smartest people uh, always don't work for me. There's millions of smart people who don't work for your companies. So how can you crowdsource the best minds in the world to your open protocols? And the last takeaway is, sorry, this is a lot. Um, if your business model is dependent on leveraging other people's data, you should rethink your business model. And I mean that seriously. Now, this isn't going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months, but this is a generational change where data will not be the use of choice for business models. So consider how you can create these kinds of crypto incentives to create virtuous cycles for consumers to participate in your economy. So um, like Burning Man attendees, who uh, wants to bend reality to their will, the promise of the blockchain is to explore less proprietary models of ownership and to free the individual from these monopolies of uh, digital cartels that we have right now in society, using the convergence of these three systems of, of, of cryptography, of incentive design, and also of distributed systems. That, I think, is the promise of the blockchain. So um, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. You might find yourself one day in a dust storm on a playa in Burning Man, or maybe in the dust storm of your own personal playa or your own professional playa. And you might find yourself at the same time hungry, happy, and hot all at the same time, because trust me, all those three can exist at the same time. You might find yourself totally thirsty, tired, and caught at the same time. And you might even find yourself lost, lonely, and loved at the same time. But I want you to know this. You'll have 70,000 new friends who will be willing to show you this magically creative, decentralized future if you're willing to bend reality to your will. Thank you very much. I know I'm over time. Uh, I know this drill very well. He's getting closer and closer. Um, we're going to a break, so you guys are welcome to ask me any questions at the break. Um, if you want to see a uh, shorter version of this talk, I have one online. I just did one on the TED stage. Um, you can go to this website, will we need to trust strangers.com, and you can see a shorter version of this that is less technical as well. So um, I leave it over to you if you want to cut me off and throw me off stage, and I'm happy to take questions if you're giving me time as well. Thanks, Tobias.